So I'm just the sort of host for this event, and I'm going to be introducing everybody and giving you a little bit of their bio so you can get to know them before you hear them reading their wonderful works. Our next reader is Soraya Khan, whose novels include Noor, Five Queens Road, and most recently, City of Spies, which won the Best International Fiction Award at the Sharjah Book Festival in 2015. Her work has appeared in several publications, which include Guernica, Long Reads, The Kenyan Review, North American Review, and Journal of Narrative Politics. Thank you. Thank you all for coming on such a gorgeous day. Um, I'm going to read from my most recent novel, City of Spies, which is a coming-of-age um, story set in Islamabad, Pakistan, in the late 1970s, during a time of particular uh, political turmoil in Pakistan, uh, because it was a time of a military dictatorship. But this coming-of-age story is also a story of a friendship between two girls, Alia and Lizzie, Alia is mixed race. She's half uh, Pakistani and half European. And Lizzie is American. And the girls are both um, students at the American School of Pakistan. I'm going to read uh, one scene from one chapter to you. And uh, throughout the book, there's a secret that ties the girls together. But in this uh, scene, they do not yet know what the secret is. So it's uh, late 1978. The girls are at Alia's house. Uh, and it's a Friday, which in Pakistan in those days was the weekend. And they're whiling away their time on the upstairs veranda instead of doing their homework. At first, the afternoon was quiet, much as it was every Friday after Juma prayers. And then suddenly, it wasn't. The gate latch lifted and fell, and our weekend chokidar, a short and fat man, carelessly swung open the gate, which caught with a loud clang on the metal hook that held it in place. Although it was unusual not to have been told we were expecting company, I didn't pay much attention to the visitors. But when they grew louder, Lizzie and I hung over the railing and observed the driveway teeming with men. Our view was better than the chokidars, and we noticed another long line of men heading into our driveway. As if on cue, my father stuck his head onto the veranda and told us to stay where we were. Who are all these people, I asked. My employees come to talk to me. Does this happen often, Lizzie asked, and I shook my head. The next time we looked down, my father was jogging alongside the column of people in our driveway to where the growing crowd had encircled our Toyota Corolla. The men had begun chanting but I couldn't decipher their words. Much to my surprise, my father hopped onto the hood of the car and then jumped onto its roof. I gasped, what is he doing? Oh, Lizzie said, impressed. In a gesture I knew well, my father extended his arms, as he did when he was overflowing with generosity. Welcome, welcome, he shouted, as if he'd been expecting them all afternoon. Thank you for coming, he started. The first few sentences of his improvised speech were drowned by the speeding motorcade of black Mercedes and police cars on Margala Road. The blinking lights and blaring sirens suggested the general was in town, and evidently he was unconcerned that his decree limiting gatherings to fewer than five people was being broken in our driveway. What's he saying? What's he saying? Lizzie asked, jumping up and down excitedly, returning my attention to my father. The truth was, I could not understand what my father was saying. Like an idiot, I repeated the English words scattered in his Urdu speech. Once in a while, I strung them together with some Urdu words that I understood. He's saying, you are important to water, power, and development authority. Your father is the boss of Vapta, Lizzie asked, and I was taken aback that she remembered the words that formed the acronym for my father's office. Yes, I said forced to be honest. What did he just say? Lizzie asked again. Rather than admit that I had no idea, I made it up. He's saying without his workers, the streets would be black at night, offices would be dark during the day, radios would be silent, something like that. While my father spoke, I considered him as I would a stranger. He was an excellent public speaker, at ease in the crowd and unperturbed by their demands. 
I knew he'd been on his college's debating team, and I could see why he'd won medals. The effect he had on the crowd was palpable, and it seemed to me that the longer he spoke, the more success he had in diminishing his employees' concerns. I thought of the Prime Minister, known for his oratory skills, and wondered what it would have been like to be in a crowd when he shouted his famous slogan, Roti, Kapra, or Makan. What's he saying? Lizzie asked. My Urdu is not fluent, you know, I finally confessed. I think that they're asking my dad for pay raise. It was only a guess, but why else would ang angry employees descend on our house? Just then, my father stumbled on his words. I thought I knew the phrase he was attempting because government officials commonly used it on the Khabarnama, the evening newscast. In this nation of ours, he said, and like a scratched record, he repeated it three and four times. He'd lost his train of thought, and I was mortified for him. But out of the corner of my eye, I saw the reason for the interruption. My grandfather was suddenly upon the scene. Everyone said my grandfather was deaf, but he constantly proved us wrong, and the fact that the noise had awakened him was yet another example. My grandfather started down the stairs, clasping his hands above his head in greeting. He was tall and thin, and what one might have expected him to fade into the crowd. But when he stepped into our driveway, people moved aside as he wove between them and made his way to my father. After the moment's reprieve granted by my, father's my grandfather's arrival, my father found his voice with even more confidence than before. What's he saying? Lizzie cried a few minutes later. His speech was coming to an end, and I suddenly recalled what he'd once said when, he'd ask, when asked to explain why he'd moved us all the way to Pakistan. When your country calls on you, you fall on your knees ready to deliver whatever it needs. Lizzie was satisfied, and since my invented translation was something he'd once said, I didn't feel too badly about the lie. My father and grandfather led the men in a final chant, Vapta Zindabad. As impressive as solidarity was, I doubted my father had the power to keep any of the promises that he just made. The general's grip was unforgiving, and pay raises wouldn't be arranged without his permission. Lizzie and I waited on the veranda until the men, one by one, and then all together, exited the gates. Our chokidar stood watch proudly with his rifle at his side, as if to suggest that since he'd initially allowed them all in, he therefore had the sole power to send them away. My father named the event by the time my mother returned home. Our house had been the scene of a mini riot. My father, like most Pakistanis, routinely transposed the I-O in English words into O-I, which resulted in an oi sound. So not mini riot, but mini royet. So as far as he was concerned, a mini royet was exactly what had happened. Unlike other instances when my father's mispronunciations embarrassed me, violent was violent, for example. Neither my mother nor I bothered correcting him this time. Listening to my father describe the Friday incident convinced me that the, that the event really did need its own word. Riot, my mother asked in disbelief, because our house was exactly as it had been when she'd left. Mini Royet, my darling, mini Royet, my father said, insistent. As far as I was concerned, my father was exaggerating. Real riots resulted in trampled lawns, burning tires, and broken windows, among other things. Riots happened in Iran and were documented on the BBC as they'd been recently when one million Iranians took to the streets to protest the Shah's rule. And where were the girls when this was going on? My mother asked in sudden alarm. Upstairs, my father said, waving at the ceiling. Weren't you afraid? My mother asked me. Oh no, I replied truthfully. I can't even trust you to keep my daughter and her friends safe while I have a cup of coffee with friends. But they are safe. Really, Mama, we were just fine. She turned my back. She turned her back to my father. Can you imagine the story Lizzie will tell her parents? Her best friend's house is the scene of a mini riot, and she and her friend had front row seats. 
I'll be surprised if the Simons ever let her come here again. That should be the least of their worries, my father muttered, and I had no idea what he meant. I was the last person to have seen Sadek that day, and when it was time for dinner, my mother realized he'd left without permission and had not made preparations for our meal. She cooked dinner and served us a non-spicy version of chicken cutlets, a step above the grilled cheese sandwiches she might have served if my grandfather hadn't been visiting. The only topic of conversation was the mini royal. Did you give them what they wanted? My mother finally asked. Of course not. I can't promise them money. I don't pay them. The government does, my father replied. Semantics, no. As far as your Vata employees are concerned, you are the government. I don't control the money. You should pay them more, you know, my mother said, dismissing my father. I bet the electricity supply would be more reliable if you did. My grandfather guffawed, and a few grains of half-chewed rice fell to the tablecloth near my glass. Thanks, Yasmin, my father said, using my mother's Muslim name, which is what he did when she made him mad. Subhanallah, she said, a phrase she reserved for being called Yasmin, and as in this case, usually a preface for her anger. This is what you left your UN job for? A country where the prime minister is sentenced to hang and people don't take to the streets, but your employees see fit to riot in our garden while our daughter and her friend watch from above on the veranda? My father's silence made my mother angrier. For the most part, she was a good sport about living in Pakistan, but sometimes she lost patience, and evidently the mini royat had sapped her reserves. She launched a tirade on what was wrong with my father's country. I squirmed in my seat, uncomfortable that she was going on in front of my grandfather. Before long, she was caught up in denouncing Pakistan's unpredictability. A democratically elected government one day, a military regime the next, the prime minister in the National Assembly one day, on death row the next, a dapper prime minister in suit and tie one day, a Nazi-like uniform general in charge the next. She took a breath and my grandfather nodded as if in agreement, even though he could not hear all she said. A quiet house one Friday afternoon, a mini royat in it the next, this place is as far away as you can get from Vienna, where buses and trains run on time, sugar and flour are not rationed, and grocery stores carry the same goods from one day to the next. She glared at my father and continued. Not to mention, in Vienna, the city's water and electricity supply is a simple fact of life. No one knew what to say until my father figured it out. Pakistan has Vienna beat in one way, he said. And what would that be, my mother asked. Choke eyes. We have more choke eyes here than we know what to do with. My mother thought his comments so absurd, she paused before stammering. And that's a good thing? My father informed us that he'd fired our weekend choke and starting the following night, we would have two nighttime choke who would spend their shifts walking rounds about the house. Is that really necessary? Probably not but government regulations will require two chokidars once security is breached in an official's home. My mother had a point. Pakistan was unpredictable. Anything could happen here. There were strict regulations for a minor security breach in an official's driveway, but a general could do what he wanted with a prime minister. At breakfast, Sadiq reported that in his absence the previous evening, the motorcycle spy had paid a visit. The new Chokidai didn't know what to tell him, so he suggested a return visit the following day. Since they had time to prepare, was there anything specific my father wanted the man to know? God help us, my father quipped. Everyone in the neighborhood knows that there was a mini royat at our house, yes, at our house yesterday, yet the spy comes to us asking for information. Sadik's appearance that morning was unsettling. His forehead had grown wider and his eyes were bulging. No one commented but he had shaved his eyebrows. What did you tell Sadiq? My mother asked. The truth, of course. What else is there? Spies aren't supposed to let people know they're being spied upon, right? I asked. My father threw, head, threw his head back with laughter. Good point, sweetheart. This is Pakistan, after all, my mother said and shrugged. 
unlike the previous evening, she was calm and matter of fact, and she was right. Thank you. Thank you.